So welcome everybody to the Dreaming Out Loud Food Business Workshop series. Uh, we are in session five. So today we're going to be talking about hiring and training resources for food businesses. I'm going to wait um, maybe just a couple more minutes to allow other people to log in to this webinar. Um, so just feel free to put anything in the chat if you have any questions in the meantime. Um, I'm going to just wait a couple of minutes. It'll just be about maybe four more minutes. Give it till 6.05 and then I'll get started. So it's six oh one. I'm just gonna wait a couple more minutes uh, for some additional attendees, and then we'll get started. Thank you for waiting. Okay. It's nice to see a couple more people logging in. So I'm just going to wait about three more minutes and then we will get started. Um, today we're going to be talking about hiring and training resources for food businesses. Um, so just feel free to ask any questions as we go. Um, hopefully this is a new class to you uh, because I did teach this class also in the um, DC, SBDC, uh, Small Business Workshops, and the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber of Commerce about hiring and training. But there are a few new things that we're, we didn't cover there that we can cover here as well. So um, I will just wait maybe two more minutes and then we'll get started. All right, thank you for waiting. I'm just gonna wait two more minutes, uh, just till 6.05, so actually one more minute, and then we'll get started. Uh, today, we're talking about hiring and training for food businesses. So if you've been to this class before, it's gonna be a lot of similar information, um, but we're gonna be talking about um, a couple new things. But if you've already been to the hiring and training resources for food business workshop. Um, this is what we're gonna be talking about today. So if you also, if you have any questions as we move forward, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm gonna just give it one more minute. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you very much for coming today. Uh, we are talking about hiring and training for food businesses. Um, this program, thank you for coming to the Dreaming Out Loud program. This is a food business um, workshop series. 
that has been um, sponsored by or in part by Capital One and Nourish DC. And our goal in this webinar series is to highlight certain things that food business owners need to be thinking about um, as they run their business. So this is support for existing businesses and people who are planning on writing a business plan so that you can have a forecast or be able to foresee what's going to be um, a challenge, I guess, in the future so that you can be aware and prepare and um, hopefully ask the right questions. Um, so today we're talking about hiring and training resources for food businesses. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a few new things that I think most of you are aware of actually for um, as far as resources that I've been talking about for the past couple of weeks. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and talk about that a little bit too. So um, we will get started. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about Nourish DC. Uh, Nourish DC is a collaborative that was created in 2021 in partnership with Washington DC government to support the development of a robust ecosystem of locally owned food businesses. So our main goal here is to help connect you new food businesses or existing food businesses with resources that you need. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about a grant that they have available this month, the month of October. I haven't seen it up yet, but I'm gonna put in the chat uh, two links that you need to have and hopefully, um, hopefully a lot of you already have these links because I've shared them a few times. Um, and these are the links for the grant that is coming up. So we have a grant that's coming up um, and it's a $500,000 pool of money that they're putting into the um, into DC small businesses. So you can apply between $10,000 and $50,000 um, and what I like to tell people is if you're not yet prepared for this grant, just pay attention to the criteria that they are asking about because the, um, the criteria is what you can do to kind of strategize how you're going to write your business plan in order to get funding in the future. So in order to be eligible for the Nourish DC grant, um, you must have a, a food business that grows, processes, or distributes and sells food products. Um, you must be physically located in DC. Preferences for businesses located in Ward 5, 7, and 8. And you must be in business and generating revenue for more than six months. And you must have earned more than $10,000 dollars worth of revenue uh, for the past 12 months. So I am not sure. I think um, a few people, he, well, actually, I think only one person here might qualify for this, but you can still be writing your business plan in order to get this funding. So just be aware of these items. Uh, we have the, the qualifications here in the chat. And then we also have the links where you can receive um, updates as far as what when the um, the grant will be available for application. And Nourish DC also has technical assistance, so they can help you apply for the grant as well. And so can I. However, I know we've um, I've done technical assistance with a lot of you already. Um, and you know that when we do technical assistance, we're really talking about certain issues at a time, and we only have an hour um, of that time together, usually. Um, I can always book more time, but I just need to know in advance so we can um, book it well in advance so I can have that time available. Um, but the other counselors really help. Um, if It really helps if you speak to the other counselors. So if you're writing a business plan or if you're needing help with marketing and branding or if you need help with applying for any sort of business loan, just ask me and I can connect you to a counselor 
and one of um, our different free business resources here in DC. Um, so I put the criteria here um, in the chat. That is a Nourish DC grant. Um, I'm gonna continue the presentation and just go into Open Access DC as well, because Open Access DC is finally launched. I've been talking about this one for months now. I think like two months now, I've been telling you all about Open Access DC. It finally is up and I'm gonna show you um, what it looks like and that how you can access it now, it's live. Um, oh, you if you can't see the chat, I am not sure why. Let me, um, I see now, I didn't actually put the chat for everybody. So thank you for telling me that. Um, and then I'm gonna repost everything on the chat here. Thank you for letting me know. So hopefully you see that in the chat now. Um, and I'll put the links there as well. Okay. Looks like I can only do it one by one. Um, but what I wanted to say is that the Open Access DC is finally live. Um, that is a big deal just because you didn't get the links. So I'll send the links as well. I'm sorry to be jumping from thing to thing. Um, but it's a big deal because this is where the checklist that you've all been asking me about, that's where it's located. So I'm going to put that link in the chat as well. So I'm about to share three links with you. I'm gonna share the um, open access DC links because it looks like you didn't get them the last time I sent them. So here is one and then here is the second one. The first link is for um, the Nourish DC website. And then the second link I'm sending you is the Capital Impact website so that you can follow um, any grant updates that there are on social media. And then I'm gonna give you this other link, which is for the DC SBDC. Um, the DC SBDC is a free resource for any business that wants to do business in DC. So if you're a business owner and you're not located in DC, but you want to do business in DC, you can actually um, still, you know, benefit from DC SBDC and the SBDC of wherever you are, even if you're outside of um, DC. All right. So it looks like you did get my. Um, links this time. So I'm glad you see them now. And thank you for your messages. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and share open access DC and what it looks like. So this is the DC SBDC website. Um, a lot of you I've encouraged to sign up for the DC SBDC. And a big reason is because we put updates on our DC SBDC website because when businesses or corporations wanna support a small business for catering or for, for something that they might need, especially right now it's really food business time for me because it's the holidays and the preparations before the holidays. This is where we put a lot of our stuff and, um, and people follow these different things so that they can, um, I guess, well, they follow these different things so they can support these small businesses. So I encourage you, if you haven't signed up for the DCSBDC, to do so and take a look at workshops that we offer. And then you also can go to Open Access DC. Open Access DC is a, is a portal where you're going to be able to get basically to-do lists and resources for opening um, a food business. So you can press here, visit Open Access DC, and you're in. So you can finally do that. I know I've been showing you for like two months now. So thank you for letting me tell you this over and over again. Um, but now you can access it. So hopefully it's helpful for you. And if you're not in DC, um, the checklist still applies. So we're the first city that this is launching at. So um, there's only an open access DC. But in the future, there's going to be an open access 
other major cities. Like I'm sure they'll do an open access Chicago, open access LA. So whenever they're doing these things, the um, the licensing departments are different, but a lot of the to-dos are still the same. So this is actually good for people who aren't necessarily in DC as well. So I encourage you to take a look at it, go through and see what you think. Um, for this group, just by looking at these businesses, where it says plan, this is a very good resource for you, especially where it says write a business plan. And it helps you with different thought processes as far as how you're gonna write your business plan. So I know a few of you are thinking through your business plan. A few people are thinking about startup finances. Um, this is another good, um, I guess, little portal that gives you different options for startup finances, or at least it starts getting you in the right thought process um, for figuring out how you're gonna fund your business. Um, so this is great. Hopefully you take advantage of it. And this just launched, this just launched last week, I think, or the week before. So it's very new. If you are exploring open access DC and you believe there needs to be an improvement, an edit, or something, feel free to email me because um, we're actively working on this. This isn't done. This is an organic, I guess, website as well. So as people find things that it might be missing, we'll definitely make the improvements um, if we can. So uh, now you have that in the chat as well. So you should be good to go there. I'm gonna stop this share and then I'm gonna continue on with the actual subject matter today because it's really, really important. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you are going to need employees or, well, not just a lot of you, all of you really, if you're planning on opening a business, you eventually want it to become a big business. And that's not the case for absolutely everybody, um, but it's the case for a lot of businesses that um, when you open a business, you open it with the intention to grow the business and see how big it gets. And we've worked on a few different subject matters as far as like visioning, planning your business, but the hiring and training of people is the most crucial part or one of the most crucial parts of a food business. And the biggest reason is because it's um, incredibly labor intensive. And so my goal in, when I'm teaching these presentations and these presentations are developed by me Therefore, they're being uh, still developed. And I'm doing it based off of um, in experience, really, industry experience, and then things that I've learned along the way in different in, in school, because uh, from the Culinary Institute of America and in different catering companies and restaurants I've worked at. Um, I have been trained in different ways. I've received very militaristic training, and I've also received what we're going to talk about today, which is um, more of the enlightened hospitality concept. But at the end of the day, for food businesses to be successful, for food businesses to be able to retain employees, you for any business really, you have to offer your employees a reason to stay or a reason to be there, um, especially in the very small phase, because in the very small phase, typically a smaller team means that there are more hands on or less hands on deck. So then those people are taking on more responsibilities. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what the workforce is like today, especially with these, what we kind of call entry-level positions, but I'm starting to see also that a lot of the entry level positions are a lot of people's forever job or their long term job plan. So when you have an employee like that, that's actually very valuable for you and for your business, but they can also become very demotivated with certain things that people tend to always do, certain mistakes that they tend to always make. So we're going to talk about. A little bit about that. But I want you to just 
think of this, and I know that you already know this, but literally it's human resources. You're, you're hiring people. And so when you're hiring people, you're dealing with a lot of different things. Um, you're basically, you, your business has a responsibility to allow them some sort of stability, number one, and to give them something that they can plan for um, as a part of their routine, because that's part of, you know, what makes somebody stable, but it's also what makes cooks better um, as far as the quality of the way they execute service and um, the way they cook. So the first question I put here was, what are the biggest challenges that service industry managers face when hiring? And you can put your answer in the chat if you'd like. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about the biggest challenges that we we usually or service industry managers face when hiring is turnover. It's training somebody just for them to leave a couple months later. Um, and a lot of those reasons is because um, people look at food production and cook jobs as jobs to kind of hold them over to something else. But as a chef, I'm definitely always looking for cooks who are, are long-term cooks who are gonna wanna stay. And the biggest reason, obviously, well, I don't think it's obvious, but is because training is very expensive. Um, training an employee is extremely, not extremely expensive, but it really is very expensive. It takes about at least four months to get somebody in a proper groove. Um, and we have such high turnover a lot of times that that's how long people even stay sometimes, especially if they're looking for summer jobs or something seasonal. So how do we get the people that are going to be effective at their job to stay? Uh, there are a few things that um, I like to talk about. The first thing is figuring out where you're going to post your job search. So um, I was mentioning this a lot before, but something about, um, I'm sorry, I just saw your text about chat being disabled. Um, so I'm going to, just so you know, it's enabled, I think. I'm pretty sure it's enabled now, so you can chat. You can put things in the chat now. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so... I was talking about job descriptions. So the first step is posting a job. And something I was talking about that I think a few of you will remember from the last time I taught this class is that there are excellent candidates these days on things like places like Indeed or ZipRecruiter. And I think that the big reason why is because so many restaurants closed down during the pandemic that it allowed or it made cooks or people transition out of the industry and now they're transitioning back in. And as they're transitioning back into the food industry, they wanna make sure that they're getting the job that is gonna be the right fit for them. Um, typically people who are going into the labor force as a cook is because they don't enjoy working from home. It's because they're, they're, they're not really um, incredibly technology driven. They really like working with their hands. And that's a great job to have. I mean, there's no job like being a cook. Um, I can say that from experience. I really enjoyed um, being a cook for all those years. And when a cook is looking for a job, a cook is looking for a clear job description. So if you need help writing your job description, just let me know. That's why you would um, schedule your technical assistance time. So if you need help with that, ask for technical assistance time, but do your best in developing your right job description. And something else that I always recommend is post the wage. Um, and the big reason why I recommend posting how much you're going to pay somebody is because it really takes away the anxiety or the guessing act from the starting level employee. Um, and the reason you don't want to do that to them is to have them give you or tell you how much they want to get paid is because typically your job description is going to require a certain amount of dedication. And that job description 
the, the dedication that it requires is going to be worth a certain amount of money. So if you, for example, and I've seen this happen before, where somebody's going to offer someone a job, they say, how much do you want me to pay you? I've seen people sometimes say too little. I think it's a bigger problem when they say too little and the employer accepts, so then they're getting underpaid for their work. And I think that that's even more dangerous because eventually the employee will realize that this is a lot more than they thought it would be. This is a lot more work than I counted on. And so they will leave because they're not getting paid enough to be there doing all that work. So you really have to be honest with yourself and with your, your financial forecasts. And I would encourage people to post the wage, uh, post how much you plan to pay somebody because it takes away a lot of that anxiety and, um, you know, something that would initially make a potential employee uncomfortable. And I think that that transparency gives them a lot more trust, which is what we're going to talk a little bit about today as we talk about training. But it just helps people get started on the right foot. So I do always encourage, you know, post how much you're going to pay somebody. And what are the tasks of the job? And you have to be very thorough um, and clear because typically entry-level employees will only do what's in the checklist. They'll only do what you listed. So you wanna be really clear. And so for small businesses, this is really interesting because typically we have positions that meld into other positions. We have like smaller teams, so people, kind of or, or multitaskers. But if you're looking for someone to fill a multitasky position, you just have to put it on the job description. So that and the schedule and the pay are all incredibly important. Something I really like about um, Indeed is that I have really received some excellent candidates from Indeed. ZipRecruiter, I also received okay candidates, but Indeed is more for cooks or people who are more production oriented. Um, and then I also included another link here. This link is to the uh, Zingerman's training. And I've shared this with you before, but this training program that is done by Zingerman's Delicatessen is in my opinion, really great. Um, I've taken it, I've seen all the materials. I, I think that as far as hospitality training for a food business, there's a lot of valuable information in this training program. So today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about certain concepts that I've learned from here and elsewhere. I've learned from here and I've taken things from the Culinary Institute of America and I've taken things from real life experience. Um, but this is a very great program that if you have some time to take it, um, you can learn about different concepts that really works for Zingerman's Delicatessen. Uh, Zingerman's is a, it started as a deli in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and then it had a lot of other businesses branch out of that core business. But Something that they do really well is offer their employees a job that they're excited to go to or offer their employees a job where they want to stay and they want to stay so much that they even create new product lines because they are going to have to increase their revenue in order for the person to be able to stay in the business. So I really love that sense of camaraderie that they have and the ability to um encourage their, their, their staff to create their own businesses within the business. So take a look at this um, when you can. This is the Zingerman's training. So I will, I was just thinking, I'm going to put the link here in the um, chat as well, just so you have it. Um, but you can also request the slideshow for this program. And it's embedded in there. Um, but here's the Zing Train program. And I do recommend on your own time because this is a very 
it says, and we don't have enough time today for this, is take a look at what they have to say. Especially, I like the open book management um, concept. And that's not for everybody. It's not everybody's cup of tea. But I enjoy open book management. And what open book management is, it's when you um, basically you manage with your finances visible to to your keep your your key players. So it's not like it's visible to everybody, but your um, but everybody but everyone who's a decision maker looks at the finances. And a big important thing that I like behind that is the fact that the employees are then seeing real world realistic numbers. Um, something that happens a lot in the food industry or in the hospitality industry is that you, since you sell so much, because it takes uh, selling many, many units to be able to make a profit in the food industry. Um, when you sell so much and get really busy, sometimes the employees think that you have all this money in the bank and they almost start to see the business as an inexhaustible resource, where that's not true. The business finances are exhaustible, very quickly exhaustible, actually. A lot of um, small businesses or small food businesses live very much kind of month to month. And the idea behind this workshop and every workshop that I do is to prevent you from living that life of the month to month finances, because that's very stressful. Um, you need to know how to strategize to be able to make more income so you can have a healthy amount of cash flow. But because it's hard to achieve, very difficult to achieve, you have to be very realistic with your employees so that you can create an environment that feels welcome and it feels open and it feels communicative so that people are, are happier where they are and they feel like they're in an environment of honesty. So the open book management has been a good tool because it really does allow people to see, for me, in my experience, they especially see the expenses. So you can make a lot of revenue, but how much money are you spending to get that revenue? And a lot of the time, your expenses aren't just your cost of goods. Your cost of goods are one thing, then it's the overhead and everything else or even pop up situations that happen as far as um, food businesses are concerned, as far as um, financial um, obligations. So when you're managing your business, open book management's really nice because you also get other people's point of view or perspective on how you can save money, how you can grow more strategically. And I think it's very helpful. But again, it's not for everybody. Not everybody likes that, but I, I do really like it. I've taught a lot of classes about visioning, um, especially in this group. And leadership development, um, I think that leadership development can um, always be strengthened, no matter who you are. Uh, leadership is the, the definition of leadership or what in, motivates people or what inspires people. It changes, I, I wouldn't say it changes a lot, but it evolves with time depending on who, who you're working with and who you're leading. So I like that they include leadership development in this, but we're gonna talk a little bit about that next in the coming slides and customer service, which is customer service is the most important thing that any food business or any business can really have. And Zingerman's has a great, um, I guess, rubric for how they teach customer service, which I've also shared with you before in their book, uh, Guide to Giving Great Service. Um, so I put this link in the chat. I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, I came across this once I graduated um, college, but um, I thought that this was even better than a lot of the things I learned there. So it's a very good um, program that has a lot of, um, it's very inclusive of a lot of different types of information. So, and that was not a, um, I also, they, I'm not sponsored by Zingerman's in any way. I just, I, I like their training. Um, 
Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about Danny Meyer. Danny Meyer is a restaurateur, um, and he's a restaurateur from New York City. Um, he had Union Square Cafe, Gramercy Tavern, and The Modern, and he then opened up Shake Shack. And the cool thing about the way he opened up Shake Shack is that his employees actually approached him and asked him if they could open a, um, a Shake Shack in, in Central Park in New York. And he said yes with one condition. He was like, we can open another place, but I don't want to work more. Um, and I hear that a lot from a lot of business owners that um, come to our programs and they say, Carolina, I want to make income. I want to make more sales, but I don't want to work more. And that is something that is very doable, but it's also very important to, to make that declaration and, um, and decide that for yourself. So Danny Meyer decided that for himself and his employees were still motivated and they still wanted to grow. So they started Shake Shack and Shake Shack today is a lot bigger than it was then. You know, Shake Shack has grown to be in every major city really as a fast food place. Um, so it's just interesting that he invested in it, but he really didn't, um, put it together, but he gave his guidance. And his guidance was based on his values as far as how he hires employees. And the way he hires employees is through he, what he believe, what he calls enlightened hospitality. So Danny Meyer kind of coined the term enlightened hospitality. And what that really means is that you're giving someone an experience that they, they feel so listened to or they feel so good once they leave that they're going to come back because of the, the type of customer service they got or the warmth behind the customer service or the attention to detail um, that the customers had uh, or received uh, by the service. So there are a few key characteristics that Danny Meyer talks about as far as hiring customer service people. But really, this is for anyone that he hires in his restaurants, cooks or front of house. Um, I believe that this is extremely important uh, for all the positions as, as well, and we'll talk about it in a second. Um, but mostly, this um, I encourage people to think about these, especially when they're trying to open a cafe or you have a few customers at a counter, or even if you have a farmer's market employee, because, or even a food truck employee, because these are all the types of skills that they need that don't necessarily have to do with um, job experience or their resume. You really have to find these characteristics in your hiring, um, I guess, whichever way you decide to hire. When I'm doing interviews, um, and this isn't something that I put in the um, in this presentation, but when I do interviews, I make sure that I meet with people with somebody that I trust. So I'm not typically meeting with them by myself. Um, I'm typically meeting with somebody else who's a key player or a key person that I know we'll be able to identify or help me see if that person has the characteristics I'm looking for. Um, so the first thing whenever you're hiring somebody is definitely making sure that you have a clear job description and that their resume obviously matches the tasks that you need them to, to fulfill. But when it comes to hospitality, um, he's talking about, I guess the first one, the first emotional skill that he looks for is kindness and optimism. And kindness and optimism are extremely important in the food industry because, again, because we work really long hours. And not just that, but um, a lot of times when you're dealing with so many people, different people have different personalities. And 
you really need the kind of person who looks at things in a positive way to avoid conflict and just to give a better service. Um, we also need people who have intellectual curiosity. So is this a team member who is looking at how they're going to improve how they do things um, or think critically about how they organize their station so that we can always be improving what, what we're doing? Um, that also especially has a lot to do with people in the back of house, in the kitchen, intellectual curiosity, um, being someone who's open to always learning something new is incredibly important because cooks are constantly needing to receive new instruction. So you need someone that is open and who wants to learn. Um, then we have work ethic. Work ethic, I think there's another one of those things that you're, no matter who you are, you're gonna be looking for in an employee. But when you're hiring for a food service employee, you really need to think about the questions that you ask. Make sure that you let them know what their schedule is going to be, or if there's any unique um, part of their job that they might not foresee. For example, Sometimes people sign up to become um, a food truck manager. And I've seen this a lot where people will sign up for being a food truck manager, being very excited because they're going to be working on a food truck. But then they see that they have to empty the tank. They have to plug it in every day. They have to do the cleaning at the end of the shift. They have to go, they have to open. And because they don't, or a lot of people, because they don't know that before they take the job, they quit very quickly after because it's not something that they were, they wanted to do. And the only reason I've seen that happen is when it's not in the job description. So that's why I'm saying, if you need help with writing a job description, let me know, because you want to make sure that you put all of the tasks. And the reason is because of, especially because of work ethic. You need to make sure that this person, whoever you're hiring, knows before they even get in there how much work it's going to be, um, because then they can make the commitment. Um, and work ethic is extremely important because in the food industry, especially, we work we work long hours and we work weird hours. We don't even work at the same hours every day. So having that strong work ethic is extremely important. And then empathy and self awareness. Uh, we're in the hospitality industry, so you need to have someone who really can read a room and figure out what's going on with the vibe of the room or, or how someone is just be able to pick up on somebody's mood or how they're feeling that day. Um, that would be more of the empathy side and the self-awareness is how are you acting and being perceived? Um, and that is another extremely important trait that you can include in your interviews. Now, the way you include them, that's something that we have to talk about one-on-one -on -one because there's a whole series of different questions that you can ask to find out, is this person empathetic or are they self-aware? Um, but for that, you would need to build a scenario um, of a, a scenario and then ask them, what would you do in this situation? Um, and even so, the first interview is always very difficult, no matter if they're experienced and well-seasoned or if they're new, because it's their first time meeting you. So I always encourage waiting, you know, to the next, the next interview when they meet with somebody um, to really hone in on those types of questions. And then integrity. And again, I think that these are five traits that are necessary no matter who I'm working with. No matter who I'm working with, I want them to be kind, optimistic, um, intellectual, hardworking, empathetic people with integrity. Um, I think that that's something that we look for in a lot of people. But when you're doing your um, your hiring and training, having these different 
values already decided or written out is very important. Um, I also, I didn't put it in this presentation, I don't think, but the this is when you definitely want to be able to have your guiding principles together. Um, your guiding principles are going to help you in the hiring process. And we spoke about this in another webinar. Um, but if you need help developing your guiding principles, make sure to ask for technical assistance time because before you hire anybody, you need to be able to have your vision and your mission of your business developed. And you need to be able to have the guiding principles so that you can lead people effectively just because they everyone's on the same page about what what guides them and what what is the standard as far as service and quality. Um, but for Danny Meyer, I really enjoyed that he pointed out these different characteristics. And this is something I want you to think about as you design or develop your um, your job descriptions and who you're going to who you're going to hire. So one way, and I was I was talking about this before, um, and then this is something that is, um, it is definitely optional, but I've seen a lot of food businesses um, using this. So the Myers-Briggs test is more of a, a psychological or behavioral test that asks you a series of questions. I included some links on here um, because I found a couple free tests that work in similar ways, but the actual Myers-Briggs test is $50 online. Um, and I like the Myers-Briggs test because it's a series of questions that basically at the end of it give you a code of what type of behavior or what type of thinker you are. And I like thinking of um, placing people in the right position uh, based on their strengths. And a lot of the time, the Myers-Briggs test has proven to be correct. So I enjoy using things like this, especially when I'm trying to um, work with a key player, with somebody who I'm gonna have as a manager or somebody that I need to work with me long-term. I like seeing what kind of personality they fall into. And mostly it's for me um, as a manager to be able to understand. Um, there's nothing like getting to know the person, uh, but sometimes these questions really, really give you good guidance as to really what type of person they are. Are they an introverted person or an extroverted person? Are they someone who judges or are they someone who is a little bit more flexible? Um, are they a person who is a thinker? So when it comes to making a decision, they need to really think it through or are they someone who's able to make um, or be decisive quickly but they're also doing it more in, intuitively. So there's, there's all kinds of combinations. I encourage you to take a look at Myers-Briggs and see why um, so many government agencies use it to be able to determine how they put together their teams. But I think it's a cool test. Um, but at the end of the day, what the Myers-Briggs test helps me do is to further understand the person that I'm hiring. Um, there are different ways to train a culinary team. One way can be a very strict way where you hire for that position and you're very hard on the person as you train them so that they get it and then they begin to execute the correct way. That would be maybe like um, Gordon Ramsay style chefing, you know, telling people what to do in a very aggressive way, because if they don't, then they feel like they're not doing a good job or they feel ashamed. 
I don't really believe in that form of training. Um, I do sometimes have to apply it. I think that every leader, every chef has to do that every once in a while, depending on the person and what they respond to. But I like to operate under um, an understanding that the person is doing their best and I'm trying to encourage them to continue doing their best. So in order for them to continue doing their best, I don't squash their confidence. I make sure that if they're good at something, I'm paying attention and I put them somewhere where I see that they're gonna be able to use that strength to their advantage. Um, and that happens all the time in food businesses. So just because I can see who is here and what, what businesses are, um, are attending here today, it looks like most businesses are new and have not quite started hiring yet. So I want you to know that if you need help as you expand and you need to hire an employee, you have resources out there for you. I'm one of them, but I'm only one person. Um, and I'm only one person, but I'm one person. So every once in a while, it depends on the month, I might be more accessible than others. So I do always encourage you, email me so I can connect you with the right um, whoever it is that can help guide you. Um, at the DCSBDC, we also work with the Department of Labor, the Department of Employment Services. And the Department of Employment Services, um, they have a program where they'll actually subsidize about six months of wages um, to help the business owner have that ability to train the employee without getting hit so badly with the costs of training the employee. So that is a very good option for our food businesses because we hire entry-level people. That's who, who we hire because that's who comes in to do manual type of work. But when you're training them and when you're training people, you have to make sure that you have all of your things aligned. You, you can never assume that anybody knows how to make anything that you offer. You can never give someone a recipe and expect them to make it correctly the first time. And so you have to train based on different um, you know, personality styles, but then you also have to train in an organized way, which we'll talk about in a second. In the personality styles, what I'm saying is, if I see somebody who is anxious, who doesn't like pressure, I'm not gonna put them on the line. I'm not going to put them in charge of an event. I'm going to make sure that they're my prep cook and I'm going to get somebody who likes the adrenaline or somebody who is a quick thinker in, the, in that other role. So it just takes a little bit of you getting to know the person. And that's why the Myers-Briggs helps you get there faster. Um, it just helps you get, it helps me get there faster just to have someone take a test rather than um, try to figure them out. Um, so then we're talking a little bit about what do you need? So now we talked about, okay, if this webinar is about hiring and training resources for food businesses, we just talked a little bit about hiring resources and kind of about training resources. But this is more about, this slide is more about training resources um, that every food business has to have. It doesn't matter if you're a snack company or if you're a caterer or if you're a restaurant or if you're a food truck or if you're a cookie company or waffles, you have to have these items. So the first thing you definitely need are checklists for everything. Um, so the checklists are part of your standard operating procedures. And as you develop your business plan, you're gonna develop what your production plan looks like. How, how do you make the food? So when you think about that, you're going to have to have checklists and things to be able to say, this is what you need in the station. So you can have a needs and plus checklist. Then you need a timeline, which tells you how, 
when, at what time, what should be getting done. Recipe manuals with pictures. Um, checking in regularly just to make sure that the food is being produced properly or that the service is being maintained. The quality of service is still cheerful, still efficient and effective. Um, and then you have to review your employees and ask them how they're feeling, but then also give them honest feedback as to how they're doing their job. Um, and giving growth incentives. Um, the hospitality industry does not give, I don't think, enough incentives for employees to want to stay a lot of the time. But I've seen a lot of restaurant groups change that now. And they're starting to offer people things like health benefits and um, 401ks and uh, different retirement options. And I think that that's so important because we really do have a lot of employees who want to stay on for life. And when you have a good uh, person like that, they will create, they will make it so your restaurant is a third place. They, they, they create or they help create a sense of community. So I like I like having the same people there for many years. And a good way to do that is to offer employee incentives. But the biggest reason to do that is because that's something that's not the industry norm. And that's what's going to make you better and different than the others. Um, and it's very affordable as well. And if you need guidance and help for how to do that, then you can also schedule some technical assistance time. Um, I'll give advice or experience um, and then you just have to shop around and figure out what companies or who works for you um, but giving growth incentives to your employees is extremely important um, either in in benefits or also in in job opportunities um, so all of these things are part of what you're going to need at each station and this is really something that if you hire a chef de cuisine, this is the chef de cuisine's job. This is typically the chef de cuisine's job or the general manager's job for the front of house. And before you even open, you should have these materials developed. You should have a checklist for every station, a checklist for every bin. Um, especially if you're going to farmer's markets or if you're going to catering events, um, your timelines. Those timelines are extremely important. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about timelines now. Um, timelines, I put these two pictures here to kind of explain that a timeline is important whether you're doing small batch production, like you're making just a meal for a private dinner, or if you're making hundreds of meals at the same time at a co-packer. And what's the importance of a timeline? So a timeline is extremely important in both cases because you as a business owner, you know how long it takes to do the different tasks or the different steps. And if you do not know how long it'll take, because I've also seen business owners who don't know the food side. Um, make sure that you hire somebody um, and get a reputable chef to help you develop these timelines in an accurate way. You don't have to have them on staff forever. You just have to have the systems in place. So the importance of a timeline is definitely that it helps ease the employee. It helps them relax. It helps them understand that they are um, there and they have a certain you know, time to do everything. So it gives them a sense of urgency because they have to get everything done. But it also gives them that sort of competitive nature to where they'll always try to do things better and faster, hopefully. Um, so a timeline is extremely important. Um, and again, this is one of those things that I do not see in kitchens very often. And it is really what is the most effective for me. Um, it's the way that I'm able to make so much food in an organized way 
with any team. And the reason that I have to do it as a consultant with any team is because typically I'm going into different teams that are established and guiding them in certain instances, but I'm not the chef there all the time. And the way you get people to be able to execute in an organized way at the least is to have a listed timeline as to what your expectations are. Because if they're not meeting your expectations, then you know that they need to move to another position or you have to put someone faster in there or they have to hurry up so you have to tell them. Um, so there's just a lot of reasons why the timeline is very important. For a co-packer, it's extremely important because you're also going to have to manage distribution. So you're working with your manufacturer. Once it's done, you have to pick it up, take it to a warehouse and manage the distribution. And so a timeline is still extremely important here as far as the cycle of your products. Um, so this is one thing that I wanted to touch upon, but all of these different food businesses are so different that this is one of those times that I say, make sure that you schedule some technical assistance time so that if you need help with your production timeline, so how are you gonna produce? How can you make it more efficient? How can you make it um, more streamlined? Then we'll work together to do it. I will say though, that you have to have the facilities to be able to make it happen. So if you, I mean, this is a little bit, this is something that I've, I've seen a lot of people ask me about is how they increase production um, if they only have a certain amount of ovens. And that's just like the type of thing that there are certain things that you just have to um, invest in more equipment because it's something that is a baked item or a cooked item, or there's things that you can scale more easily um, that don't require buying a lot of equipment. So when you're developing your menu mix, we'll talk about production and then we'll make sure that you can hit the numbers that you need for your production. Because at the end of the day, the most important part of the timeline is that you're tracking efficiency. Because if you're not sticking to your timeline, it means that you're not profiting off of your food item as much because it's taking longer in labor and labor is costing you a lot more. And labor is expensive. The, one of the expenses that you can control the most, but also gets the most out of hand is labor. So when it comes to when you're giving someone a task, giving them a timeline is extremely important. And it's something that does not take that long to do. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And then I wanted to talk a little bit about inventory. So this is an inventory list. This is something that belongs um, in every area where you have food in your kitchen, either in the refrigerator, even at the bar, or on your shelves as dry storage. And you should be filling out an inventory list every Sunday, hopefully. So every week, typically we do it on the slowest day of the week. And a big reason that we do this is to see if we have too much money tied up in inventory. And also if we're moving things quickly enough, if, if, if ingredients are cycling out. And we already, in a previous workshop, we spoke about menu design and menu development. This is where you're gonna see the real effects of the menu design. Because when you have your inventory, you'll be able to see if you can only buy something by the case or if you can buy something in small quantities and you're able to track the behavior of your prices from your wholesalers. Um, 
So if you need help with an inventory list, again, ask for technical assistance time. But somebody should be taking inventory um, every Sunday, really, like every week. So when it comes to that, training people to do it, such as having the proper spreadsheets, um, having the proper uh, pictures or images of the, the station or the area, all are very, very important to have. Now, this is very unique to every business. So what I usually recommend in training for any station, any station, is to have an inventory list, a timeline, and an ingredient or recipe book, um, which is what I'm gonna talk about next. We have, I guess we have always had, hopefully, written recipes, or this, this same logic that applies to your home applies to the business. If you have a written recipe, you're gonna be able to improve it. So when you start with a recipe, it'd be great that you start with the most perfect recipes, but sometimes uh, when it plays out, when you see how it happens in production, you make different adjustments. So I do encourage always to have a recipe binder and your recipe binder should have a picture it should always have a picture of the dish. It should have your ingredients and it should have the method in which it was produced. It's good to have a recipe binder in each station or for each different product line, um, but you have to have a recipe binder. And the biggest reason you need a recipe binder is to make sure that the cook or whoever is able to follow a standardized, a standardized recipe and also to be able to control your food cost. Uh, your food cost is gonna be also one of the more, the things that you can control the most but it gets the most out of hand, just like labor. So because of that, um, I always say you have to have a recipe binder. And this is a little bit of a controversial recommendation because a lot of people don't want a recipe binder because they say that there is, um, that they have a secret recipe. But in food, you really, it's very difficult to have a secret recipe. Uh, you can always patent your recipe, but then it becomes, the recipe becomes public knowledge. And if you keep your recipe secret, how are you gonna scale it? How are you gonna hire people to produce it? So this is where I always also recommend, you know, have a good attorney or someone to, um, to help you with the non-disclosure agreement. In the DCSBDC, we have um, the DC Bar Pro Bono that we work with and they can help with certain legal services, but, your written recipe is one of those things that I don't think that, I think that every restaurant should always have them. And I don't think that you should compromise on that as a business owner, because sometimes you get sick or something happens and you can't be there. And then at least you have someone trained to continue going with it. So um, I only say that because it usually is a little bit controversial. I get a lot of questions about well, you know, what if I don't want to write my recipes because people because then they'll just go out and open a restaurant to compete with mine. Um, and that doesn't happen very often. It doesn't really happen at all. Sometimes chefs do take um, things that they've learned from other restaurants and apply them to new menus. Um, but I would look at that more as like an evolution of cuisines. Uh, when people enjoy something, they want to replicate it or they want to try to make it better. Um, so it's more of a compliment. And then as you grow, you're also going to be also continuously evolving. So that's why I really do always say that um, in every circumstance, having a written recipe binder is extremely important. Um, and 
that's it. I, I mean, I don't really have much more to say than the fact that you need it. And the reason I wanted to put this in this presentation is because there are lots of, lots of food businesses that I ask them for their recipe and I don't get them very quickly. Um, very rarely does anyone have the recipe written. So just make sure you're writing it down, that you're weighing it, that you're, you're finding out your food cost because your cooks are going to do exactly what you instruct them to do. That's a good cook. And a bad cook takes liberties, takes creative liberties. But the cook's job is to execute exactly the way they're trained to. So because of that, um, once you have a written recipe binder, the chef or someone that's a consultant or whoever you, you, you hire in to help maintain your food quality um, can use that as a tool. But you always need that. So when you're training your employees in the food business, and a lot of you are actually going to probably be training for production purposes. So I put, I'm, I'm more talking about producing food because most of you have businesses where you're taking a product and you're going to sell it to the consumer. But I know also a lot of you don't have employees and you're going to need them because if you want to hit big sales, you're going to need an extra set of hands, inevitably. Um, no matter what. So the tools that I'm hoping that you take from this today in hiring and training resources for food businesses is definitely these things. So the standard operating procedures, the timeline, and the inventory list. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about, because we don't have that much longer here today, is your guiding principles. Um, we have only a few classes left in this webinar series, and then we're gonna go into the um, Crossroads webinar series, which we're actually postponing. Uh, that one was going to be this week, and we're actually postponing it for next week for those of you who wanna go to the Crossroads um, Tacoma Park webinars. And that was just because I had a personal um, a family situation, but um, I will still share with you the classes that we're going to have for the DREAM program. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, upcoming webinars. The webinar season is ending. So it's ending soon. We're not gonna have as many webinars anymore. And then you're gonna just be able to watch them online. And then you're gonna be able to schedule technical assistance. Um, I will begin giving webinars again around March of 2023. So this October is the last month of webinars. Um, for the Dreaming Out Loud webinar, the main goal is to give food businesses resources. So I try to keep it pretty general because these businesses, these, these resources are things that all the businesses need. Um, and if you need specific advice, then, then definitely schedule your technical assistance time. But we're going to talk about working with a manufacturer next time. So if you missed that one from the Greater Washington Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, you want to come to this one if you plan on working with a co-packer. Um, and this is something that I recommend for most snack companies is working with a co-packer but it's, there's a lot to it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and what you need to be projecting for and thinking about as far as the capital that you're gonna to need to raise in order to, to get to that, side, that, that step or that level. Um, then we're gonna talk at the last day, October 14th, about approaching your investors. And for October 14th, approaching your investors, I would love to have a few volunteers, um, if possible, if you feel comfortable. I would love to have a few volunteers to help in this class by doing um, a pitch. So if you would like to do a pitch, 
on October 14th and you would like to test it out, let me know. And then we can kind of go over it um, before you try it. But I'd like, to, I will talk about a business pitch in this, um, in this workshop. And then at the end, I want somebody hopefully to pitch their business so that we can see it as not coming from me. And I'm gonna talk about how to develop a pitch and how to approach investors in this class. So I'm hoping you'll be able to make it. I have a secret, a secret prize at the end of this one. Um, and it's not food related. It's just a fun event that I want to invite people to. So I hope that you come to that class. Um, but this is where the events are posted. So don't forget to register for uh, this class. But for this one, I'm going to just kind of go back to my presentation. And I'm going to talk about the next class. Um, the next class, we're going to talk about working with a manufacturer for your food business. In this class, we talked about hiring and training employees for hospitality businesses. Um, I didn't I, I didn't go super in depth because we don't have time. But if you need help in hiring and training your employees, you can get technical assistance uh, from me um, at the DC Small Business Development Center, and we can create your standard operating procedures. In order to work with a manufacturer for food businesses, you need to already have your standard operating procedures in place. You have to have a production idea, you know, of, of what your production is going to look like, what type of ingredients you're going to probably need, um, and what your turnaround time is going to have to be to fill your purchase orders. And all of those things are... Um, I don't want to call them advanced thinking, but they are um, something that you have to think of a lot of layers. You have to think of a lot of levels before you hit the big, the big picture or all of the things that you need in place in order to execute this. So if you're working with a manufacturer for a food business, it's a very wonderful thing because you can scale your business really nicely and quickly. But if you have a baked good, or if you have a bottled good, like a sauce or something, or a salsa, or if you have um, a candy, you need to find the right manufacturer for you. Or sometimes you even have to develop your own manufacturing facility in order to, um, because sometimes co-packers don't want to work with your ingredients and that's okay, but then you need more infrastructure in order to execute your business plan. So working with a manufacturer for food businesses, um, we're gonna talk about how you approach them and what different things you need to look at as far as your facilities and how you're gonna set up your labor structure and, and what you're gonna do for, um, you're probably gonna need a couple of rounds of funding to be able to make this happen. If you have a specific question beforehand that you want me to cover, feel free to email it to me. Um, but my main goal in what we talked about today and what we're going to talk about next time, and then when you go pitch it, pitch the, the business idea, it's that you've thought of all of the different steps of execution. And when you're developing your manufacturing facility or, or um, whatever, a restaurant or, or catering facility, uh, your financial forecast is really going to matter. So if you have not started working on your financial forecast, start. And if you haven't, then let me know um, and then we'll get started. I know a few people got started with Live Plan last week and have started putting in their um, their expenses for their business plan. So I was really happy to see people start to use um, Live Plan as a resource to be able to gather those, those um, projections, but you definitely need them, especially if you want to apply for a loan or a grant. Um, but just to go over a couple of things just from today before we leave, because I really want you to be able to have 
the right thought process behind hiring and training in the hospitality industry. The main thing you're going to have to do is write an outline of who exactly do you need in order to execute your business plan. And whenever um, we met and spoke about your vision, um, I also covered about figuring out or thinking about all of the different parts of the puzzle that you're going to need in order to make it happen. Um, when you're developing this, make sure that you have all of the, the positions in place, but they're very detailed. You write exactly what they're going to do because whenever they go apply for something, they really will only do what they saw listed in the, um, in the job search. And a big reason is because that's just the type of employee that you're, um, you're getting, um, depending on what your budget is. But you're not really um, searching as much for somebody who is going to set it up for you. If you're looking for someone who's going to manage the business for you, then that's an entire um, business development manager. So then you can hire a business development manager that has food service experience. And if you need help with figuring out how to hire certain key players, then that's when we schedule technical assistance time. But please take a look at Zingerman's for hospitality training if you're curious because they have excellent lessons. And my favorite is the guiding principles. Um, and we're gonna talk about those when we do our business pitch as well. But your guiding principles are basically just the values that you want your employees to have and that you want to have every time you sell anything in your business. So um, we will go over that for the pitch competition. And then just going over Danny Meyer, if you like to receive um, reading resources, consider uh, renting or purchasing Setting the Table, uh, Setting the Table by Danny Meyer. I'll write it here. And then that's a great book about hospitality. Um, okay, it's setting the table I wrote. I forgot the N in there. Um, but that's a good book about restaurants. But I know that a lot of the businesses looks like not that many businesses here have restaurants. So, um, but this is more so applying to restaurants in the book Setting the Table but for hospitality industry, kindness and optimism, intellectual curiosity, work ethic, empathy and awareness and integrity are all personalities that you need. Now, in how to make that happen, that's when you schedule the technical assistance so you can have that assistance that you need and training that you need to be able to coach people through those um, personality types. And then as far as the resources, if you need help developing your standard operating procedures, please try to create something yourself. And if you just don't know where to start, um, now you have the checklist of what you need. So if you have the list of what you need and you don't know how to do it, that's when we'll work together and do it. And if I have enough people that want to learn a particular thing, then I can schedule a group um, a session where we can work on, on that. So. If you would like to have a class on how to write a job description or how to do a job posting, then we can even work on that. Um, but I just am going to need enough requests and then we'll set up a time. But make sure that you have your checklists and your timeline for every station. So if you make um, a baked good, you have to have all of the listed formula of everything that you're going to make in one batch. And you're gonna have to have the checklist for everything else that they need. The tools, you're gonna need packaging and all kinds of other things. So all of those checklists are based upon what department they're working in. And if you need help dividing how you're gonna make that a uh, comprehensive job and develop your team, then we can work on that together. Um, so those are all the main points I wanted to share today. Um, 
this was a pretty quick class, but if you have any questions, I'm going to stick around. There's only a couple minutes left for this one today. Um, if you have any questions about next class or working with your manufacturer, feel free to ask it in the chat. Um, and if you would like the recording to this one or any of the previous workshops, please just um, request it because Dreaming Out Loud is posting them um, and they started sending me recordings already. So uh, just feel free to request it if it's something that you need. And then if there's any other subject matter that you would like to learn about, um, I'm going to be taking the beginning of this year of 2023 in developing things that um, the classes that people have been asking me about. So if there's anything that you think that might be of, of value as a business owner, um, these are new webinars. Um, so any feedback is really, really great because then I can work on those subjects and we can um, learn, you know, teach them and learn about them together, even if I have to uh, bring somebody else in to, to talk more about it. And then if you have um, did not see on the chat, make sure that you visit Open Access DC and find all of those things that I've been talking about the whole way through about the checklist on how you can open a food business in DC because that's extremely helpful. Um, so that's about it. Um, I don't have any questions there so far, so I'm just gonna stick around. And thank you for coming tonight to this webinar. Thanks for sticking around to this late night call. I have another class next at 8 p.m. So it's gonna, gonna be a fun night of a bunch of class giving, but hopefully this one was helpful for you. If you need help with hiring employees, please let me know. And also don't forget that um, veterans and um, there's a lot of associations and organizations that try to place people who are looking for work. And I really like working with military veterans. And that's something I said last time I taught this class that I don't think I had said yet in this one is think about your community, who's around you, and see who fits in. Because typically someone who's involved in the community is the best kind of person to have in your in your growing food business. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you everybody for coming. Right. Looks like nobody has any questions, so I'm just going to hop off, and I will see you on Thursday and Friday. Um, oh, wait, there's a chat. Oh, this is thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye.